on this uh, Facebook Live here on the Promise LA page. And if you're listening off of the uh, our YouTube channel and uh, our, our website there, um, this is uh, the Sunday afternoon where we take time to hear, Thus saith the Lord, what God has to say to you and to me uh, in today's times. Amen. And um, I think this is really building up to something special as the Lord has been uh, speaking to my heart over a couple different things and where we're going, uh, not only as a, a, a community of online believers, but uh, also in person as we're, we're creeping up towards that. You know, I know I've been saying that for uh, a little while now, probably a couple of years. And, uh, you know, but as, as God has put a, a, a vision and uh, in, on my heart and where we're going, I am very excited, and uh, which is the reason I, I truly believe that God has uh, given us some instructions in which to go to prepare our hearts, to prepare our lives, and uh, in, in what he has in, in store. And, and he has some great things in store, if I can say that myself, um, for you and for me. And I'm excited about that. So uh, God bless you. Thank you for joining me on this Promise LA page. Whether it's on the website, the Facebook page, or YouTube channel, uh, thank you. Today we start a series called Stand, you know, and it, uh, it's, it's based out of the, 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 verse, the verses, the passage of scripture uh, that we know, if you're familiar with the Bible and, and if you've been around church for a long time, uh, it's, it's based out of Ephesians chapter 6, where we usually and customarily and even traditionally Talk about the full armor of God. Now, before I go into it, let, let me tell you why I felt led uh, to, to go and talk about this particular series over the next few weeks. Um, it was uh, right after Easter Sunday, and, and uh, many of you know you've been following. We just finished our Easter series. But following uh, Easter Sunday, there was a, uh, a post, I guess you could say, on social media which uh, a, a person which I believe was genuinely seeking had asked the question, if Jesus indeed conquered death and hell and sin at the resurrection, amen, at the resurrection, Easter Sunday, resurrection morning, then what is the need for spiritual warfare? If indeed he has done all of that, then why is there spiritual warfare? And out of that question, and I didn't respond to it because how many of you know uh, you can you can hasten a little bit more debate than you can answer sometimes in, in social media. But the some things were resolved in my heart as I prepared for this uh, for this series uh, and going into the series that I, I definitely want to share with you um, to answer the question to all of you. I believe as the Lord had put something on my heart was. It has a lot to do with the dispensation of ages. Now that's a lot of, that's a huge theological term. And I don't want to lose you in, in, in terminology or, or, or theological language. But basically over the course of time, God had what they call different dispensations. How he was going to administer or how he was going to run an administration. Now here in the United States and other countries along around the world you know what administration can look like right every four years we have an election of a president and when the when the president uh is is either re-elected or a new president is elected we have what we call a new administration and that administration will lead and 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 dictate policy according to what he believes to be right or at least we assume to what he believes to be right and what is right for our country the same is true with God. Over the course of time, and, and we study this in, in some theological and bi Bible courses in college that I'm sharing with you, that over the course of time, God has different administrations or what we call dispensations of time. For example, uh, in the beginning of Genesis, there was a dispensation of innocence, of how God uh, was, had an administration over Adam and Eve when when there was no sin in the world and what what their calling was to be to go and and uh have authority over the world and uh and and to be fruitful and multiply the same is true when 
uh, after the post flood era when uh, he told uh, Noah to do the same thing to be fruitful and to multiply. You know, you come to a place of uh, of an administration or a dispensation of conscience or a dispensation of law or a dispensation of, of promise. And uh, those are all true. And you could study all those things. I don't want to get too much into that in this message. But we have what we call now and in, in the day what we're living in is the church administration where God had set up his church post-resurrection, uh, post-Pentecost when the Holy Spirit had come and he had and and he had set up his church, you know, following the Pentecost Sunday, amen, or what we believe to be Pentecost Sunday, and he established his church. We live in that church age. And so to answer the question, you know, if, if God indeed uh, defeated sin, death, and hell at the resurrection, what's the use of spiritual warfare? The spiritual warfare is for the time which we live in. In the church age because let's face it if God got rid of everything that was sin and everything that was of hell and everything that was of death a lot of people would go along in that destruction amen he would put the seal of times there and uh, but the Bible is clear that in in um, in in second Peter chapter 3 verse 9 that God is long-suffering towards us not willing that anyone should perish but all should come to repentance. That's why he established his church, a church that would maintain a relationship with God, a church that would uh, worship the Lord, the, uh, 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 a church that would be drawn close and, and, and into growth and maturity and be, uh, be the same as Jesus, the likeness of Jesus, and have a purpose, and, and, and to, to proclaim his gospel message amen and with this call and with and with this mandate for the church comes the necessity of of, of spiritual warfare we have to to wage uh, uh, against the wiles of the devil as the bible says because how many of you know when you're on the side of god the 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 devil who is our who is our opposition who is our enemy he's the accuser of the brethren will come and try to thwart, to, to try to come and deceive, to try to come and discourage, and and, and to come and discredit the the people of God, and 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 the Bible is clear that we must stand against the wiles of the devil. As a matter of fact, that's where in this passage of scripture, the apostle Paul uh, starts off even before he says to take on the full armor of God. He says something else. He says in in, in Ephesians chapter 6, verse 10, he says, Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the full armor of God that you will be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. Now, I know that so many of us, we, we, we take this premise of mind that when we have the full armor of God, it is to fight. It is to fight. But how many of you know that before you can fight, you need to be able to stand. It says stand. He says right here, he says, put on the full arm that you may stand against the wiles of the devil. We're not called to fight because the Bible is clear that the fight, the, the, the fight is of the Lord. The, the Lord it is the Lord who fights our battles. Amen. It is God that, that has the power to overcome. It says, be strong in the Lord and the power of his might. See, so many times we talk about spiritual warfare and we think that we have to do this on our own. We don't do this on our own. We're called to stand, you know, stand in faith, stand in the promises, amen, of, of, of God. We need to stand uh, in God, in his character, knowing that he is good. We need to stand in his word and knowing that it, his word indeed is true we need to stand on his promises understanding that his promises are certain if we just stand amen that word stand means to to remain steadfast and firm regardless of your of, of, of what your situation of your and your circumstance we, we need to stand in regardless of people's ridicule saying why, why are you standing for god has has God indeed stood for you? Look at the place and where you're at. Believe me, I get that. 
Uh, we need to stand regardless of what the enemy throws at us. We need to stand in our confession of Christ as our Lord and our Savior and our King. Many of you have responded to that call over the last few weeks to accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. Today, I charge you to stand in that confession. Stand in your pursuit of Jesus. That, that is what our, our, our mandate as Promise LA is, is to pursue Jesus with all of our heart. Amen. We need to stand on the promises and the purpose in which he has for you and for me. We're not called to stand on our own strength. The Bible says, like we just read, to be, to be strong in the Lord and the power of his might. Amen. His might. Uh, Isaiah 41 verse 10 says this, Fear not, for I am with you. Be not dismayed, for I am your God. He says, I will strengthen you. I will help you. I will uphold you with my right, righteous right hand. Stand. Stand in all that. Stand in his word. Stand on his promises. Stand on who he is. See, this whole series, we're going to study the full armor of God and how each, each piece of that armor causes you to stand on the on the uh, uh, to stand against the wiles of the, the devil. Now we all know that the that the full armor of God is a metaphor. Amen. You know we don't see people today, even in our nation's military, having the having a breastplate of righteousness. Right? They don't have a a, a, a helmet of salvation. Oh, they have their there are other pieces of armor, and for those of you who have served in our nation's military and continue to do so, my hat's off to you. These are crazy times, and my prayers and my thoughts are with you always. But today, we, 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 we see this as a metaphor, and, and, and we can understand that back in those days, people understood what Paul was talking about. And so this whole series, we're going to talk about how, how these things looked back then, how they applied back then, and how they apply to us and all of this it, it will help you to stand to stand my encouragement to you in this whole series and you'll possibly hear me say this the, the the next six weeks to stand to stand to stand means to posture right yeah you, you don't you're not standing when you're lying down and being a couch potato watching basketball or football like i usually do i'm sorry to, to confess that you don't stand when you're just simply just waiting and saying, you know what, I'm just going to sit here and wait. No, you're standing, you know. Well, I know that the Bible says to wait on the Lord, but it doesn't say light in wait. It says to stand, to, to have a proper uh, a, a, a posture. And if I could add to that, it is a posture of preparation. To prepare against the wiles of the devil, but to also prepare for what God has for you. Because if you cannot overcome, if you cannot stand against the wiles of the devil, how are you going to prepare yourself for the great promises that God has for you? And so today, today, uh, we're going to start with the first piece of the armor, the full armor of God. We're going to, we're, we're going to talk about what we call today the belt of truth. Now, I know the belt doesn't sound like anything heroic. It doesn't sound like anything that's needed, not like a, a shield or a helmet. It, you know, you'll hardly even see it when, when people depict the, a picture of a, of a Roman soldier, right? But how, do you, how many of you know that the belt was very essential in the armor and the, and, and the armory of a, of, a, of a Roman soldier? We call it today the belt of truth. You know, as the 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 uh, the belt of truth is is so essential to to the uh, to the armor that the that the apostle Paul in, in some of the translations says to gird up your loins. You know, to gird up your loins. That that word, to, the the phraseology for the time means to prepare for something difficult or agonizing. You know, yeah, my dad used to say that. You know, when when uh, during the summertime, says you need to tighten your belt. You know, you need to get prepared for the uh, uh, for the tough times in life. You know, and it, it really meant to, to, to so I want to prepare you to go through something difficult. But to prepare you to, to, to go through something difficult without equipping you 
it is it is really indiscriminate. It really is not having a vision. It means you can go anywhere, you know, with that. But the Bible says to to gird up your loins with truth. You don't just gird up your loins with anything. Not with your own mentality, not with your own wisdom, not with anything, but to gird it up with truth. Now, just for the sake of definition, every time we talk about the belt of truth, we're either going to refer back to Jesus, who is the way, the truth, and the life, amen, or the word of God, which the Jesus himself tells the Father, your word is truth, amen, your word is truth. And so when, when we talk about uh, to, to, gird, to prepare for something difficult or agonizing, it means prepare yourself, you know, for so, that with truth, with truth. And, and what I mean by that, it means that, you know, whenever you hear somebody's opinion or ideologies or anything like that, whether it be on social media or the news media or someone just giving you their opinion, if you know the, the word of truth, you know Jesus being the truth, you ought to be able to say, that's not true. Because God's word is true. Jesus' word, Jesus is truth. That is the standard that we as, as believers and followers of Jesus Christ, that's, that's the standard we live by. He is truth. And so when you gird up your loins with truth, that means you're preparing yourself to saying, I need to know what is true. I need to know what is right. I need to, 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 to be able to discern, to understanding what is right and what is wrong. Because when we go through this life, everybody in their world will have an opinion and their mother will have an opinion. Everybody in the, in the world will, will say, no, this is what I think is true. The, your truth may be different from my truth. And this is what I believe. And, and so many times when you don't prepare yourself, you don't gird up your loins with truth, then you could fall for anything that's out there. And I'm going to explain that here in a little bit. But, but I want you to also know that to, 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 to gird your loins with truth will help you grow it will, it will help you transform, meaning it's going to affect your character. It's going to help you in the, in the life of service that God has you. Uh, you know, he's going to equip you for that. And, and it's going to help you be closer to Jesus than you've ever been. How many of you want to be closer to Jesus than you ever have been before? Amen. Amen. And that's the goal. Amen. So girding your Lord with truth. And so in this word that, that I'm about to give you today, I'm going to give you three aspects of the belt of truth. I'm going to give you three things to consider as, as the call to gird up your loins, meaning to prepare for something uh, that's agonizing or problematic. How does the truth help you with that? How does, what is the, 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 the role of the belt of truth. And as we discover how these roles, uh, how, how this takes a role in the full armor of God, you'll discover how it plays a role with you as well. Amen? The first thing I want you to know is that the belt keeps you fastened and surrounded by the truth. It keeps you fastened and surrounded by the truth. Amen? Um, you ever you ever wear a belt? You ever been in between two sizes? You know, maybe maybe you're losing some weight or you're dieting or or maybe you're you're the opposite. You're trying to gain some some weight for your health sake, and you find yourself in between two two belt holes. You know, and and if you tie it too tight, then it, it affects your your back a little bit. You can feel that. Or if you tie it too loose, then your pants starts to sag. It's it's still above your hips. But you can feel it sagging, right? And, and and while you're walking or while you're moving, you you still have the the need to pick up your pants a little bit, and and it and affects you, uh, your mobility. It affects you from from moving forward. You know, the same is truth with the belt of truth. You know, if it if it's not correctly fastened, then then it then it then you know basically it, everything starts to fall out see even more so in that in those days because the soldier would actually wear a tunic which we would consider like a robe maybe a one piece gown for men you know and when when that soldier is not in battle the what he's wearing is maybe his uh bef the underlying armor were were consisted of rows of steel plates 
that he wore over his tunic. And, and while he's walking around and not wearing his belt, you know, it, it might, you know, uh, move around a little bit. It, 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 it might, you know, sway from, from the way he's walking. But when it was time for battle, he would take the tunic and he would take these strips of metal and, and, it, and he would fasten it close to his body so that it was tight. So that way when he runs, it's not out flopping around everywhere. Amen. It's, 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 not, it's not, you know, uh, uh, running around in the wind. It's actually close to his body. And it keeps him uh, uh, mobile. It keeps him moving forward because it, it is fastened. The same thing is, is, is true with the truth. When you gird your loins with truth, it is fastened to you. It, it, it's not... It's, it's not running around. It's not flopping around in the wind. It, it is not swaying around on your body, you know, thinking it might, it, it, you know, it, it might fall, even fall off because it, it sways around so much. When we do the same thing with truth, sooner or later it will, it will, it will flop around in your life. It, will, it may even fall off, you know. What does that look like? When you don't fasten the, 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 the belt of truth to you, and you hold everything together, all of a sudden, interest in, in gaining knowledge of the truth is optional. It, it, it's not supreme. It is, it is not the, 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 like my friend Chris Taylor says, it's not the big rock. You know, it's, it's just an option. It, it's just something that you might consider if it fits right with you. It, the obedience to the word of God and the obedience to the truth is subjective at best. Like it says, hey, you know, if, if, if it fits with my plan, then, then I'll be obedient. See, and that's not what we're called to do. The, the, to, to, to be fastened and surrounded by truth, to be surrounded and fastened by truth means that it becomes the number one priority. It means, it means that I want to be, I want to know God more through his truth, more than I want to know anything else in this world. I want to know the truth more than I want to know statistics in, of, of, of my sports team. I want to know the truth more than I want to know the odds of a certain game. I want to know more about the truth than I want to know how, many, how, how much horsepower I can get off my motorcycle or my car. I want to know more about the truth than I want to know about anything else in this world. I want to know more about the truth than I want to know more about what the Democrats are doing or the, what the Republicans are doing. I want to know more about the truth so I can be obedient to his word because I want to trust in his word. I want to trust in his truth to know that it, that in, that is what will sustain me. That is what will, will, will help me grow. That is what will bring me closer to Jesus. Jesus says this in, in John chapter 15, verse 7, If you abide in me and my words abide in you, you will ask what you desire, and it will be done for you. That word abide means to accept or act in accordance with a rule, a decision, or a recommendation. I, I hated to use that word recommendation because God's truth is not a recommendation. It is, it, it, it is a standard in which we are to live. It means that we have been sold out to God's truth. It means no matter what might look better on the other side, it might not. It may not be uh, what what is newer and and sounds better. It means that 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 no matter what, we are sold out to the truth that is found in God's word. It, it would require complete trust. It would require obedience, and 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 it would be mandatory. Uh, in our lives and and what it means is that when it when jesus says that that if you if my if you abide in me and my words abide in you you will ask what you desire and it will be done for you do you know what that means that's that's victory amen that means you have been so abided in god's ways and his word that you can that 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 it's it, it is so much uh enveloped your life and transformed your life that you can ask whatever you wish that your desires will be God's desires, that it will be done for you. Amen. Hebrews 4.12 says this, For the word of God is living and powerful. It is sharper than a two-edged sword, piercing even to the division of the soul and spirit and of joints and marrow, and in the discerner of the thoughts and intents 
of the heart. It, it sounds like a spiritual scalpel, amen, doing spiritual surgery on you and I. That's what the Word of God does, you know. Whatever it does, it is cutting, it is dividing, it is separating. It is separating what is what is of the world and what is God, of God. It is separating what is of flesh and what is of the Spirit. It is separating of what is true and not true. It is separating what is good and what is evil. When you get into God's truth, it will, it will teach you what is right and what is wrong. And in this world in which we live in, some of those areas can be so great, you know. And, and as I said before, but when you get into God's truth and when you get into God's word, when it is so fastened to you, and, and it's surrounded your entire being, and it's surrounded by your, your whole world. It'll make you stronger in the faith, and it'll cause you, it'll cause your character to be more and more like Jesus. Amen? Amen? Second thing I want to tell you is that the belt of truth will keep the truth central to your posture. You know, when, 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 uh, when you put on the belt of truth, how many of you know you can't just sit down with that fastened to you? When you put on the belt of truth, you can't just lie down or lie down comfortably. You see, the belt, along with the belt, which was probably made out of a thick leather, it also was equipped with these brass rings around it, almost like pockets, you know, where, where, where a soldier could probably uh, put his sword in there so he can carry his sword. It had rings in there just in case he, he needed to put some some coins in there just in case that you know he he went astray and he needed to go get some supplies um you know maybe some some food or water or whatever it might be maybe bandages whatever it may be today if we had a belt of truth we'd probably put our 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 cell phone charger or 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 bottles of water in there but but it was it was kind of like you know a utility belt you know for batman's utility belt it was kind of used for that you know, he couldn't function without his belt. You, you, how many of you can see just just uh, a, a soldier carrying a, a, uh, a sword and a shield and, uh, and everything else just in his hand? I mean, it, it doesn't look right. He wouldn't be effective. And in the same way, you as a, as a soldier for Jesus would not be effective without the belt of truth. It, it is our default place to go in the heat of battle. For our lives, not just for our lives, but for the lives of the people around us. How many of you know that when you're a soldier, it is not just your life in stake, but the, the soldier right next to you is, 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 making, is, is dependent. His life is dependent on knowing that you are fit and knowing that you are surrounded and knowing that you have the belt of truth, the, a belt in which that you are well equipped for the battle ahead of you. It doesn't just affect your life. But it affects the, the life of the people and the soldier next to you. Amen. The Apostle Paul knew exactly what that meant because while he was while he was, he was in Corinth, you know, he experienced different philosophies and different ideologies, different gods, and different standards of living. But when he wrote back to the Corinthian church, he said this. He says in in First Corinthians chapter two, verses one and two, and he says, brethren. When I came to you, I did not come with excellence of speech or of wisdom, because the, the people of Corinth thought that was, uh, you know, really subscribed that if you were uh, a great orator or you had, um, you know, if, if, if you were eloquent in speech, that you must be of God, you know. So he says that I didn't come there. I didn't come with sound wisdom of speech or, or the, but he says I came not to know anything else among you except for Jesus Christ and him crucified. He says, I didn't want to know all these other philosophies that, 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 um, that fed your flesh. I didn't want to know anything else that, that, that about you know, uh, mythology or, or any of those other things. But I came determined to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. He said, I, I, I put Jesus out there because he, he is my standard. He is my life. Amen. He, he, he is the sustainer. He, he is my redeemer. He says, I, I don't want to know any of these other things. Um, I, I don't care 
about about what other people believe and what other things pertaining to life. Jesus is my life, and He is the reason why 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 I do what I do. You know, I do that because of what he, he has done and what he's accomplished on the cross. I do that because he is the fulfillment of the word, the prophecy, and I trust in him. Amen. You remember the story of Peter in chapter in, in Matthew chapter 14. In Matthew chapter 14, uh, the Bible says that that Jesus told his disciples to to, to go and into the boat and he will meet them on the other side. But somehow on the journey, the 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 water started to to get a little bit rough. That they were so fearful of their lives that that Jesus came walking on the water, right? And 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 and, and the, the 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 disciples started to get scared, and they're like, "Hey, it's a ghost! Oh no, someone's gonna come and get us because we're about to die in these waves!" And 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 the the truth of the matter is that it was Jesus. And Jesus came to them in the midst of the storm. Jesus came to them in the midst of the storm. How many of you know that when you're going through a storm, Jesus comes to you? Jesus comes to help you. Jesus comes to sustain you. He comes to lead you out of the storm. And Peter sees Jesus and says, Hey, Jesus, if that is really you, bid me to come and let me walk on the water. And Jesus says, Come. Come on, Peter. Let me show you some things that which which when you're with me, I can show you some things that you, that I'm able to do through you. And and for a while, Jesus starts to walk on. I'm sorry, Peter starts to walk on water himself. He's the only disciple in the whole Bible that can say that that he walked on water, following after Jesus. But while he's the only one that can say that that he walked on water, he's the only one that can say that can tell us to keep our eyes upon him because. When Peter looked at the winds and he looked at the waves and he saw that, how in the heck am I doing this on my own? He started to sink because he took his eyes off of Jesus. See, you and I need, need the truth, Jesus Christ, to be central in our lives. Not anything else, not other methodology, not other, not other uh, doctrine uh, uh, that is out there. Not other, not other uh, way, means to live, not other standards to live, not even the waves, not even the winds, but to keep Jesus, because Jesus will keep us above the water. He will keep us above the storm. He will keep us to, uh, to where he can use us and that we could, we, we could be victorious over, over the things of this world. Amen? How do we let the truth be central in our lives, keep your eyes upon Jesus. Get into his word. Understand his truth of what he's teaching and what those who, those who have followed him also teach today. Amen? Keep your eyes upon Jesus. The last thing I want to share with you is that the belt will keep you upright and mobile in the truth. It will keep you upright and mobile in the truth. Amen? You see what happened back then is that the the soldiers would wear these tunics which were long you know it's like a gown so to speak or a robe that went to their ankles but when they were called to battle they would take their tunics they would wrap it around their legs and they would fasten it inside the belt and the, and it would help them to uh it would help them to stay mobile it would help them from not tripping in in times of battle it would help them to 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 to, to stand and not and not stumble or fall. Jude verse 24 says this, now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling. Who's him? Jesus. Amen. To keep you from stumbling and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy. Oh, we do a lot to stumble on our own. Amen. We do a lot to fall on our own. We make we 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 get distracted we, we, we make some bad decisions, and it would cause us to fall. But how many of you know that the Bible says that though a righteous man falls many times, it is the Lord who picks him up? Amen? How does he do, do that? Because of the finished work of the cross. See, when you and I put our faith and trust in Jesus Christ, he becomes our Lord and our Savior and our Master, but also the Holy Spirit of God the very power of God starts to live in us. The same power 
that rose Jesus from the dead now lives inside you and I. And because of that, we, we see uh, uh, the Bible says that the Holy Spirit is just a deposit. It's just a deposit, a small deposit of the, uh, the great inheritance of which we have in Christ. See, for you and I, for us to walk in the Spirit of God, maybe some of you don't even know what that means. I want to talk to you about that, what that means. But it's just a small thing. When you walk in power, when you experience his victory, when, 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 when he's able to keep you upright and mobile and he keeps you from stumbling in this world and, 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 keeps you to, and he's able to present you faultless uh, before the presence of God. And he says, no, 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 no. He, he's not guilty. He's guiltless. He's accepted me as his Lord and Savior. My blood covers him. Your Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit of God is upon him. And, and, and I'm able to, 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 to present him as being faultless in your sight. See, when, when you put on the belt of truth and you believe that to be true, even though, even though you fall, even though you make a mistake, you know that that, that does not define you. You don't stay down when God is picking you up. Amen? This is the charge. This is to help you to keep advancing, to keep you mobile, to pick up that tunic. You know what that tunic represents? The world, the world around you will cause you to stumble. It will cause you to fall. It will cause you to be defeated. But pick it up and put it in the belt of truth. And when the truth, when it's sized up against the, the, the word of truth, the God's truth, the, the things of this world will fall. And it will keep you upright. It keeps you believing. It keeps you hoping. It keeps you growing. It keeps you drawing closer to God than you've ever been before. It keeps you looking more and more like Jesus. It keeps you serving with more fervency. It, it keeps you bearing more fruit. Can I tell you something today, church? If, if, if you're getting burned out in serving, if you, if you feel like you're not bearing fruit, get closer to the Word of God. Get closer to His truth. Amen? Amen? Yeah, yeah, put on the belt of truth. Now, you know what? I could say all these things to you. I could, I could, I could admonish you. I, could, I can exhort you in, into putting on the belt of truth. But how, do you, how does that work for you and I? What are some of the fundamental ways of putting on the belt of truth for you and I? First of all, there, there's ways for you to do that by yourself, and there's ways for you to, 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 to do that in fellowship. And you're going to need both. Because on your, on your alone time, spend some time with God. Get into His Word. You know, even if it's just a, a small devotional, start someplace. Start, start writing down some of the promises that are, that are for you as a believer in Jesus Christ. And then, and then when you get into fellowship, and when you get into fellowship, um, you know, maybe it's a small group or maybe you're hanging out drinking coffee with another believer. Share what you, what God has shared with you, you know, and, and, and start, start understanding what it means to live in your life and, and girding your loins with truth, preparing yourself for something that's coming. This, these things you're going to need to do in the days ahead. Uh, the days ahead are going to get harder and harder for the, for the people of God. And I don't say that for you to fall away. I say that because you have a promise that God will, will sustain you. He will, he will empower you. And he will see you through in victory. And when you come to that place of victory, you will, you will, you will know something more about, about God and of yourself than you never have before. And that's what I want for you today. And as I say always, as I say always, it starts with knowing Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. It starts with saying, you know what, I'm going to put my faith and my trust. Knowing that Jesus Christ came into this world to pay, pay my debt, my, to pay my price. You know, sin is costly. And we've all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. But, you know, the, the, the thing is, is that even though we have sinned and, and we can say, oh, it's just sin. That's what the world will tell you. It's not a big deal. But it's a big deal if Jesus Christ came to pay the cost. Have you ever thought about that? How can you say it's not a big deal when Jesus Christ 
left the splendors of heaven, knowing that we were doomed to death and hell for all eternity. And if he didn't come, that's where we would be. There would be no hope. There definitely would be no joy. There would be no eternity awaiting for you and I. There would be no relationship with Jesus Christ. And if that is true, if that was true, that we know it to be, then Jesus Christ knew that there had to be someone to pay that price, and it was him. That's why he came to, to this world. That's why he came to suffer and to, to bleed and to die on that cross, to give up his own life as, as a sacrifice for you and I. And, and, and if that is true, and it is, then all we have to do is say, Lord, forgive me. I put my trust, I put my, my debt on, on, on that account, that, that account that Jesus Christ paid. And you say that, that I'm putting my faith and trust for all eternity in Jesus Christ, not in my own strength, not in my own merit that I think I'm a good person, but on Jesus Christ and him crucified. And if you're listening today and you haven't done that, I, I implore you and I beg you to do that today to make your eternity certain and, your, and, and his promises for you to be sure. Today, if that is you, maybe, maybe you've done that before, maybe as a child in Sunday school or in a youth rally or maybe on one of these, these other events that we all go to, but yet your life might have gone astray. You can come back to him. There's nothing that you have done that he doesn't know about or that he hasn't already forgiven. So today, I want, I want to implore you. I want to, I want to plead with you. Give your life to Jesus Christ. And it starts with prayer. Will you, will you allow me to lead you today? It just starts today by saying this. Say, Dear Lord Jesus, I confess that I have sinned against you and that I am worthy of death and hell. But it's only because you came into this world to pay for my sin debt. You paid for my price. You paid for me that I have the hope of heaven. I, I surrender my life to you now, Lord Jesus, as I believe you went to the cross for me to die, to bleed, and to be buried, to die a horrific death that I deserve. But Lord, on the third day, you raised up from the grave, and that tomb is now empty. And now, because you live, I, I can live also for all eternity. I ask you to forgive me of my sins, as I accept you today as my Lord and my Savior. I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. If you prayed that prayer with me today, the Bible says that he has now written your name in the Lamb's Book of Life, and that you're, you have reservation in heaven, and, he's, and he now, uh, uh, you are now part of the fold, so to speak. You're part of, you're the sheep of his pasture, amen, of our Good Shepherd. And you, and you belong to him, and he belongs to you. And so today, if that is you, I want to ask you today to do me a favor. If you're listening to this on Facebook Live, or maybe just on Facebook itself, will you write underneath the, the, uh, the comment section, say, Pastor Daniel, that was me. I, 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 I said that prayer with you. I gave my life to Jesus today. Will you write that? I want to, I want to put a Bible into your hands. I want to put a, um, some material into your hands. I want to send them to you. Um, and so you know exactly and you're well equipped of the, of the decision that you made today. That it wasn't just a, a, some flippant decision that you made, but it was the decision that matters to you and the people around you for all eternity. Will you do that? Say, Pastor Daniel, that was me. And uh, if, if you're listening to this on YouTube or if you're on our, on our, um, on our webpage, Will, will you send us uh, uh, me an email? Um, you could you could send it to promiselosangeles at gmail .com, or you can put contact us uh, on on our webpage, and I will be sure to contact you. Uh, I know that there's been some of you in the past that that unfortunately it went to our spam folder, but I believe I've, I've contacted each and every one of you, and I want you to know that I am praying for you. Uh, I love you, and I want to be a resource for you as you walk through this life. Uh, in your walk with Jesus. You're going to need some help. I'm going to need you as much as you need me. 
And so please, the answers are not because of Pastor Daniel. The answers are found because of Jesus Christ. And if I can impart some wisdom, in which is, he's given me over the past close to 20 years now, um, some things that I'd be able to, to, to share with you from his word, I would be happy to do so. So please, if you would do that, connect with me, um, you know, send me a message in one of these different venues, and I will be sure to connect with you, okay? God bless you. If you have made that, mess, that, that decision, you are in for the greatest ride of your life. So please, uh, make sure that you connect with me, and I'll be sure to connect with you. God bless you. Have a great week. If you are in need of prayer, please uh, let us know. If you want to join us for Thursday night prayer meeting, uh, I will be happy to, to, to that you would join us online via Zoom. We have people all over the world now, um, people all over the world now, and, and uh, uh, that joins us on the, in these things. And so uh, I, I would be happy to, to, to have you be a part of the a great prayer movement that I believe God is starting. And, um, you, you know, there'll, there'll be posts up on the Facebook page, and there is a place to, uh, to put that uh, on, on, on our web page as well so you can gain some information of how you can join us on Zoom. God bless you. I see some of you on there. Um, including my own sister uh, who said that prayer. I will be in touch with you guys. God bless you, and I will talk with you soon. And uh, if there's anything I can do for you, please do not hesitate to ask. I will be happy to, to serve you. And uh, God bless you. I'll talk to you soon.